Hey everyone, Shay here. Thank you for tuning in to our online experience today with Grace Church. I know this may feel a little bit different for some of you watching online, but we're so grateful that we can be together virtually during this time. Now we're going to worship and sing together and then we'll hear a message from Pastor Rick. But before we get started, we just want to give you some information. If this is the first time you're joining us today, welcome. We are so excited that you chose to tune into our service. We would love to know who you are, so please take a moment to text the word GUEST to the number 31331 and we will be sure to get back to you as soon as possible. While we are in the middle of this COVID-19 crisis, make sure you are subscribed to our many social networking pages so that you are getting up-to-date information, as well as new content you can share with your friends. So if you have not done so already, follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube before the service ends today. We will be trying to post up-to-date information daily for you, so stay tuned. If you would like to know more about us, watch past services, or give financially to Grace Church, check out the Grace Church mobile app. If you want to download the app, it is available on the App Store and the Google Play Store. You can also text the word Grace Church CO app to the number 77977, and you'll receive a text with a link which will download the app on your phone. If you'd like to give to Grace Church through the app, click on the Give tab at the bottom of your screen. There, you'll be able to set up either a one-time or recurring gift. If you'd like an outline for today's message, open up the Grace Church mobile app and click on the Media tab. Then, click on Sermon Notes. You can also access our weekend outlines on our website by clicking on the Watch tab, then on This Week's Service, and the message notes will be available there. As the service is about to begin, we ask that you let us know that you're here by leaving a comment. When the service is over, be sure to stay tuned for an important message from Pastor Rick. On behalf of the elders, staff, and volunteers here at Grace, thanks for watching today. Enjoy the service. Thanks for joining us this weekend for Grace Church Online. We're so excited you're here. We're going to kick off service by singing some acoustic songs together. So if you're at home, turn up the volume, let us know you're here, and let's sing.
time will come For I know my God is in control And His purpose is unshakable Doesn't matter what I feel Doesn't matter what I see My hope will always be And your promises to me Now I'm casting out our fear For your love has set me free My hope will always be And your promises to me It's time to 
everybody. Happy days are here again. And you're probably thinking I've lost my mind because you're going, really? I'm stuck at home. It's not what I would define as happy days, but we're going to kick off a series. And I'm very excited to follow that great video that takes me back. And, and of course, the worship song that, that really lays the groundwork. We got 10,000 reasons and more to be happy, to be thankful, to be praising God. I mean, his love and mercy and grace and uh, the reasons for praising him are infinitesimal. They're just beyond uh, innumerable. And as we kick off this series, I, I have to tell you, I, I think back to growing up, and I lived in the, uh, I was born in the 60s, so we had the 60s and 70s of my childhood, and I can still remember sitting around in the living room. We had one black and white television, and there were three channels, 
two, seven, and nine, or, or four, seven, and nine. I can't remember which one. Two's been around a while. And uh, we would watch TV shows when they came on. And you kids, listen, you had one shot to catch the show. If you were lucky enough to get your TV guide and circle the time and the date, and you made it, you got one shot. And if you didn't catch that TV show, good luck, because reruns were sometimes hard to come by. I remember Saturday morning cartoons, man. Uh, Scooby-Doo, every Saturday morning at 7.30. Like, yeah, I didn't have to get up at, you know, early every day of the week for school. But, man, I wanted to catch Scooby. And so I'd wake up early and get my, uh, you know, Fruity Pebbles or whatever there was back then. And I would wait for Scooby to come on. I love Scooby-Doo. If you missed it, out of luck. Yeah, I know today you can get whatever you want, whenever you want it. And it kind of takes the mystique out of it. There was a lot to be said about building anticipation. But those days were simple. Today, we live in a time where um, we're all buried in our mobile devices. We got our phone, got our iPad, kind of doing our thing. And we miss what's going on around us. <clears throat> and you know what ends up happening? They, they, this has been a scientific medical discovery that your mobile device is causing discouragement and depression. It's causing anxiety. It, it, when you have it taken away from you, you're having withdrawals. And listen, I don't mean you. I mean me too. I'm just as guilty. I'm on my email all the time, answering texts. I'm busy all the time. I have to literally push it to the side. And whenever I do, this is what I get. Oh, pastor, you're just ignoring me. Oh, pastor, can you get back to me? And I'm like, no, I just, I need a break. And all of us do. And so for the next few weeks, I want us to talk about happy days. Happy days are here again. Happy days are not and have nothing to do with your condition, your living situation, a pandemic, whether you can go here or there or anywhere. As a matter of fact, when you think about happiness, the world's definition of happiness, uh, the philosophy of most people in the world, and this isn't putting people down. This is true. All you have to do is watch commercials or TV and, and you'll see it. And by the way, I should have just stopped and said, thank you for tuning in. Thank you for continuing to be Grace Church around the world, our virtual extended family. And if this is the first time you have joined us, you are awesome. We love you. Thank you. Stick with us till the end. I know a lot of you click on it. You see it for a few minutes. You get my ugly mug and you turn it off. Don't miss out. God's got something for you. He wants to say something to you today, and I believe it's this. You can have true, genuine, joyful happiness right down to the soul if you just listen. Just a few minutes. Give me, give me the next 35, 40 minutes, and you won't regret it. Now, in, in saying that, here's how we define happiness. A lot of people think that happiness, real happiness, comes from the inside. Well, I'm here to tell you real happiness is not internal it doesn't come from a power source inside. And yet you'll find in most colleges, universities, educational institutions, even a lot of churches and mosques and, 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 and uh, uh, you know, synagogues and, and, and philosophies and books, you'll find them saying happiness is inside you. Well, the truth is if they're talking about me, the, the, the complex person I am, happiness is not inside me. It's not inside you. Real happiness is not external. It's not con cons uh, consistent with the outside forces. Thank the Lord. I mean, if we were really, truly believing that real happiness is external, guess what? We'd be miserable right now. But we don't have to be. We can actually find this reality out. And I want us to, to jot it down. If you didn't download the notes, you can go back and download them on, the, on your uh, mobile app or on the website. We want you to take God's word and really look at it. Apply it to your life. Real happiness is eternal. It's God's to provide forever. And he says this, as his children, he wants to provide happiness for you. He wants to provide, I, I, I tell this, every time I talk about this subject, I can't help but tell this story. I remember being accosted by this woman in the church about uh, 22 years ago, and I was in the foyer, and I just preached a sermon uh, from Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, which is, by the way, eight keys to being happy, because the word blessed in the Greek, which is the, the language of the Bible was written in 2,000 years ago, means makareos, not makarena, but makareos, which means happy. 
And so I preached the eight keys to happiness. Man, she's up in my face, in my grill. The moment I walk off the stage, we're in the little building. She said, that's not true. God doesn't say Christians are supposed to be happy. And I mean, just miserable. And I'm like, uh, actually, yeah, he does. No, that's not right. God wants us to have an internal joy. And I'm like, I don't think you have either. And I ended up just trying to explain, but she was dead set on being miserable. <clears throat> she was one of those people, and she eventually left the church, that just looked angry all the time. You remember the old song? Uh, Christians need to learn this. Remember the old song? If you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. If you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. Right, you know, we used to sing that song. I got a new one for you. If you're happy and you know it, tell your face. If you're happy and you know it, tell your face. That's what we need to do. Because most Christians look like they were, you know, baptized in lime juice and they took lemon juice for communion. It's not okay. God says, I want you to experience true happiness. And we've given you lots of ideas over the last few weeks. I've tried to share some, some practical ways that you could be happy and enjoy your family. Some of you are actually doing this. Some of you are alone and you're actually enjoying your alone time. You're getting outside, you're working out, you're, you're doing things that are good for you and you're not exposing people or being exposed to this pandemic. And you are doing your part as an American to protect people's lives. And it's probably not yours you're protecting. It's probably somebody that's got an immune compromised disease or they're elderly or they're just in a position where this coronavirus could be fatal. So great job. But you've learned that happiness is not a state of being, it's a state of mind. And it's a personal experience that comes from the reality of knowing Jesus as your Savior. I love Psalm 16, verse 11. Let's look at this on the screen and read it together. God's present to us. And, and you know, wait, before I read the verse, let me just say this. God's present to us is his presence. God's present to us is his present in us, his presence in us. When you come to know Jesus as your Savior, he comes to live inside of you, in the person and work of Jesus Christ. In Psalm 16, verse 11, it says, You will show me the way of life, granting me the joy of your presence, <clears throat> excuse me, and the pleasures of living with you forever. Did you catch that? His presence brings us pleasure and joy of knowing that we're going to live with him forever. God's present to us is his presence in us. Now, can anything defeat us? Well, from an earthly perspective, you might say, yeah, I could get this virus and die, or I could lose someone that really means the world to me. Uh, my friend, not even death can separate a Christian from the love of God. You cannot be defeated. Psalm 30, verse 11, and take note of the fact that these psalms are written by a guy named David who struggled at times with being melancholy, even discouraged, sometimes depressed, did some bad things in his life, but he understood this reality. It says, then he broke through and transformed all my wailing into whirling dance of ecstatic praise. He has torn the veil and lifted from me the sad heaviness of mourning. He wrapped me in the glory garments of gladness. How could I be silent when it's time to praise you? Now my heart sings out loud, bursting with joy, a bliss inside that helps me singing. I can never thank you enough. Oh, I love that. What an amazing passage. You know, David was oftentimes misunderstood and even scorned by, by his wife. By one of them, <laughs> he didn't make all good choices, that's for sure. And you know why they scorned him? You know why they made fun of him? Because he was so happy. Because he let his celebration out. Because he loved to dance and sing before the Lord. So today, my hope and my desire is that you will find happiness right where you're at. And it's not coming from inside of you. Unless it's coming from the power source of Jesus' spirit living in you. It's not coming from within you. It's not coming from outside of you. It's coming from the eternal promise of God's presence living in you. What does that mean for you today? You know, I, I can say this. Um, this is the greatest church in the world. 
I'm just going to say it. If you've never had a chance to come here inside the walls of this building, uh, we extend way beyond that. But if you ever get a chance to come here in any of our four services, when it's time and it's safe, you got to come. You will find the most authentic, genuine, humble, loving, amazing people who love to celebrate God. And I want to say something to them. If you're tuning in with, to us for the first time, and it just hold on. This is just a real quick conversation or a real quick comment uh, to this church. You guys are incredible. You supplied so many resources, so many donations, that we were able to give kits of food, toiletries, um, sanitary wipes, uh, antibacterial soap, children's food, diapers, everything to people that took care of them for five to six days during this pandemic and is still going. You guys kept begging for opportunities. I think of Paul saying throughout the Bible, the Apostle Paul, I want to thank you guys in Corinth and in Macedonia for begging me of ways to give money. You guys have begged us to give more. You guys are amazing. Thank you. You know, I had one person that offered a whole truck filled with, with frozen meat and um, uh, perishables, and we couldn't take them because in the you know, midst of this pandemic, we had nowhere to store it. And put, I just thought they were willing to drive over a huge freezer truck and give it all to people. You guys are the best. So we sent them to a food shelter, a, a place that has more storage and obviously freezers and whatnot. But I, I just wanted to say that. So how can we truly experience happiness in the midst of suffering? Well, there's four keys, and they come from one of my favorite chapters in the Bible. It's James chapter 1. And these four keys are really essential. You can't have true happiness without them. You know, when I was a kid, we moved into a house that was built in 1900. And the, those old kind of Victorian style, it looked like a castle, had all kinds of little secret rooms. And when I moved down in the basement, one of those secret rooms was down there. And there was a little key that looked like a skeleton key. And you used to use it, put it in the door, and you could walk in. Well, the first time I actually got inside there, we probably lived in the house a year and a half, two years. It was kind of cool, kind of creepy, could wind back under the house. It was awesome. That key unlocked a corridor, and by unlocking that corridor, it was an adventure. It literally unlocked a whole new world of anticipation to me. You know, sometimes you get used to all the mundane stuff. If you'll take the four keys I'm going to share with you from James chapter 1, when it comes to happiness in the face of overwhelming suffering, you're going to have an entire world you never imagined open up to you. And it has nothing to do with the, the internal or the external. It has to do with the eternal. So the first key is this. We find in James 1, and before we read it, you might want to jot it down. Remember, you can go back, download the notes, and, and fill them in right there on your phone or your mobile device. Recognize my place in God's plan and my powerlessness to change my current situation. You're like, wait, did you just like make that up because we're in the midst of a pandemic? No, God made it up. Because it's his promise. It's true. You know, I think about this. If, if you've ever been on a boat, I love boats. Love to be out on the water. Love, love, love that. Love to wakeboard and surf, wake surf and all that kind of stuff. And for years, we would just go out on other people's boats. And then God blessed us with a real inexpensive little ski boat that we had about 10, 12 years ago. And we love it. We love to do it. I love to take other people out. Of course, that's kind of ended now with the lake being closed, and I'm talking the last couple of years. But, but what you find out real quick when you're on the water in a little boat is that you're really powerless when a storm comes up. You're at the mercy of the water. You're at the mercy of the sky. You're at the mercy of the elements. <laughs> at the mercy of the waves. I've actually seen two boats sink on the very lake where I've skied. And why? Because they didn't respect the fact that that those elements were more powerful than them. When you and I recognize our place in God's plan and our powerlessness to change it, that's when we actually become strong. Matter of fact, in the book of Proverbs in the Old Testament, he, Solomon writes in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 and 6, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean on your own understanding. 
In all your ways, acknowledge him and he'll make your path straight. Listen, when you trust in the Lord, you just stop and go, God, you're in control. I'm not in control. I surrender to your will. And you know what he does? Boom. He opens up corridors you never saw before and your path is straight. It's amazing. So the first challenge is that. Look at James chapter 1, verse 1. Now this is the half-brother of Jesus, a skeptic, a cynic, a non-believer, until he sees Jesus risen from the dead. And then he, he becomes one of the most powerful figures in the early New Testament church and dies the death of a martyr. Look at this. He says, greetings. My name is Jacob or Jacob. The Old Testament correlation uh, to the New Testament Greek is James. And I'm love. I'm a love slave of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm writing to all the 12 tribes of Israel who have been sown as seeds among the nations. Now, I'm just going to tell you something. There ain't one brother in human history, including my little brother, who I love dearly, we're best friends, that would say, I'm a love slave. Whatever my brother tells me to do, I'm going to go and do it. Uh, no, that doesn't happen. Unless the person that you are serving is God. And James said, I am here by love to serve God and my brother, Jesus, who is my God and King. It's a beautiful picture and a reality of Jesus's genuine authority. You know, James showed his humility. Um, I talk a lot about the fact that if your brother believes you're God, you're God. You're not a phony. Okay. But, but I also love this reality. James starts his entire book by saying, I'm a servant of God. He could have started out by doing what a lot of us, I've been guilty of this. Start out by saying, well, you know, I know Jesus, uh, probably get you an autograph for nothing. Might even get a chance to shake his hand because he's my bro. He doesn't do that. He's completely humble. He says, he is my God, my king. You know, some of us right now, we're just in this moment where we need to stop getting angry and upset about everything that's going on around us because we can't control it. But God does control it. You know, this virus has brought us to our knees in the world. It has stopped an economy that was exploding at a rate it never has in American history. It has stifled. Every, it's caused 3.9 million Americans to go on unemployment. It's caused billions of dollars, trillions of dollars of damage. And some of us are like, yeah, Rick, I, I mean, how can you say that everything's going to work out? I don't. God does. And when he says it, he means it. So the first thing I want you to do right now, right where you're at, is just in your mind, recognize that God is in control. You are powerless. And what he wants from you is that uh, you ask him to change your current situation according to his will. That's how Jesus prayed. He said, my father, not my will, but your will be done. So the second key, remember, we're opening corridors and each one builds on the other and they, be, they open our lives up to a beautiful adventure is this. Respond by allowing God's word to change my limited view to God's eternal perspective. It's mouthful, but it's really important. First thing we have to do is recognize our present situation, our inability to change it. The second thing we have to do is follow this plan in James chapter 1. Look at this. My fellow believers, when it seems as though you are facing nothing but difficulties, see it as an invaluable opportunity to experience, listen, the greatest joy that you can. For you know that when your faith is tested, it stirs up power within you, here it is, to endure all things. And then... As your endurance grows even stronger, it will release perfection, that's the word maturity, into every part of your being until there is nothing missing and nothing lacking. He says, you want to be mature? You want to be able to handle situations you've never handled before? Trust in the Lord in the midst of suffering and respond appropriately. Now, that doesn't mean, oh, I have to just walk along. Oh, everything's fine. I never get upset. Nothing hurts my feelings. No, 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 that's not what he's saying. He's saying in your heart of hearts, in your spirit, guided by his Holy Spirit, your soul, respond to him 
with an attitude that says, Lord, I can't see what's down the road, but I know you can. Lord, I don't know what the future holds, but I know you hold the future. And trust him in the midst of it. You know, let's just be honest. This whole thing has upset a lot of us. And it's changed the way we live probably forever. Now, I am a little shocked that people are having to take courses on how to wash their hands. I'm like, uh, what have you been doing before that? I'm a little shocked when I hear the airlines say, oh, we're now fumigating our planes and wiping them down. I'm like, uh, that doesn't sound too promising about the last 40 years of my flying experiences. <clears throat> Man, I tell you what, even the way you go to the bathroom, I hate to be crude, but you know, I used to go to a roll of toilet paper and spin it like it was the will of fortune. Now I sit down and turn it like I'm cracking a safe. I'm like, ooh, I'm gonna, well, I can use two sheets today. And, you know, we don't understand why this is happening. And, and it sort of changes the way we live. I mean, it changes the value of things. Saw a lady walking out of Walmart. I don't know if she knew it or not, but she had about a 10-foot uh, piece of toilet paper hanging out of the back of her pants. And I thought, man, quit flaunting your wealth. I mean, it's just like bragging about your money or something. But, I, I, I mean, in all seriousness, we need to respond appropriately. We need to respond this way. God says in his word that there are five perspectives regarding our problems, and he uses them for five reasons. Now, <clears throat> I want you to take this inventory, if you will, this week of all of your problems, and I want you to put your problems, whether it's the virus or a loss of job or marital issues or, or health, and I want you to put them through this Five-point test. The things that you ask God really boil down to five words. God, are you using problems to inspect me, direct me, correct me, protect me, or perfect me? First of all, inspect my current attitude and reaction. So the first thing I try to do, and I've been doing this for 24 years since I preached this sermon for the first time, is I just say, okay, Lord, what are you trying to inspect in me? You're allowing this into my life. It's affecting me a specific way. What do you want to change about the way I see things, about my attitude? Then second, Lord, how are you trying to direct me? Do you want me in a different place than where I was? Some of you are like, man, I lost my job. Now, I'm not saying this for sure, but maybe God didn't want you in that job. Maybe he's going to bring it back, or maybe he's going to move you somewhere else, and about six months from now, you're going to say, wow, wow. What I thought was the worst thing that happened was the greatest thing that happened. A third question and the third test is, correct me. God, are you trying to correct my decisions or my lifestyle? Some of us have been alone in the quiet, at home, in ways we haven't been for years. And we have to sit there kind of with our conscience and the Holy Spirit and really process things we haven't processed for decades, quite possibly. And you have to ask that question, God, are you trying to correct my decisions and my lifestyle? Fourth, God, are these problems here to protect me from a worse situation? You know, think about a person that told the story the other day that they were headed to a hospital <clears throat> and they got in an accident. The, the woman had coronavirus. She didn't know, but she had to be tested. The ambulance was sent. They picked her up. They took her to another hospital. That night she got critical and they put her on a ventilator. And the story went on to say that the hospital she was headed for was out of ventilators. She would have died. She would have died before transport. Sometimes God allows things like that to protect us. And then finally, perfect us. Now we're never going to be sinless here on earth. We are going to have a sinless nature. God sees that sinless nature. He's forgiven all of our sins, but he wants us to grow to maturity. So he's saying, I want you to be perfected into the image of my son. If we don't grow to the point where we're becoming a little bit more like Jesus each day, then those hurts and those pains and these kinds of sufferings are being wasted. Don't waste a suffering. <clears throat> you know, the the first world problems that we're facing right now, uh, not enough food, <clears throat> not enough toilet paper, not enough antibacterial soap, those are first world problems. If you've ever been where I've been or places like it, where people still live like they did thousands of years ago in many, many respects, 
uh, toilet paper doesn't exist. Hand sanitizer doesn't exist. Hygiene doesn't exist. And there's no food. They have to hopefully grow it. And if they don't, they don't eat. They have to catch it or hunt it or they don't eat. They look at us and say, wow, look at all this wealth. And we look at them and say, wow, look at all this poverty. But the truth is God is stripping it all away from all of us to teach us to depend on him. So God, are you allowing these problems to inspect me, direct me, cor correct me, protect me, or perfect me? And it could be one or more. It could be all. You know, try sitting with your family and just enjoying some time. Try sitting alone in silence without going stir crazy. It's not a bad thing. And I'm preaching to me right now more than any of you because I have the hardest time slowing down. I feel like I'm failing by laying down in the middle of the day or sitting down and watching. So, I mean, I'm okay at night, 9, 10, 11 o'clock is usually when I, I shower and go to bed after a workout. I'm okay then. And I'll lay there for an hour, two hours, and I don't feel bad. But if it's in the middle of the day, I feel like I'm failing somebody. I'm letting someone down. There's always something for me to do or that I can do. So I'm learning to be silent and to sit and be quiet. So respond by allowing God's word to change your limited perspective into his eternal perspective. Third way, the third key, if you will, is request that God gives you his wisdom to see circumstances the way he does. Do you know that this book of James actually promises this? Look at this in James chapter 1. This is a life verse. It's not the only life verse, but it's one of the main life verses I've lived by for my 35 years in ministry. And if anyone longs to be wise, ask God for wisdom and he will give it. Boom, right there. Just circle it, a star it. He won't see your lack of wisdom as an opportunity to scold you. How good is our God? He says over your failures, but he will overwhelm your failures with his generous grace. My goodness, that's powerful. Just make sure you ask empowered by confident faith without doubting that you will receive. For the ambivalent person believes one minute and doubts the next. Being undecided makes you become like rough seas driven and tossed by the wind. You're up one minute and tossed down the next. When you are half-hearted and wavering, it leaves you unstable. Can you really expect to receive anything from the Lord when your condition is that? Now, guys, here, here's something really important. We're all going to have struggles. We're all going to doubt at times. He's not saying that. As a matter of fact, he says just the opposite. Ask me for wisdom. I'll give it to you. And though I'm the all-knowing God who's <clears throat> everywhere at the same time, knows everything before it ever happens, is unchangeable, though I'm all of those things and so much more, I won't mock you. I won't ever scold you for asking. You know, I believed God. And 31 years ago, I told a friend, I told my wife, I want to start a church. I believe God was calling me from the age of 12 to do this. And you know the first place I went? This verse. God, I lack wisdom. Hey, man, when you're 22 and a half years old, you barely know enough to uh, pay your own bills, let alone lead a ministry. And so for me, it was leaning into this verse over and over and over again. I don't look at worldly wisdom or my own personal wisdom, and determine things based on that. That's why I'm a visionary. I look and say, God can do anything. Somebody said to me the other day, are we going to change our uh, goal for this year, which is to raise $4.2 million, so that we can help countless families with the overabundance that will come in, hopefully, and uh, change their lives and their situation? And I said, why would we change? Well, because of the pandemic and people aren't going to work and, and people are losing their jobs. I said, well, that happens every day in somebody's life. And if we based our decisions and our goals and the vision God has given us on circumstances, we'd never get anywhere. I can promise you that 31 years later in this ministry, we would be nowhere near. Matter of fact, we'd have been done a long time ago. We'd have been washed up and finished up. I'm so thankful for uh, the elders I serve with and Jason and Jim and, and our staff who sometimes, as one of them said to me the other day, hey, man, I really respect your leadership. Most of the time when you say stuff, I think you're crazy. But then I go, you're right. It worked out. And I go, well, it's not because I'm right. It's because God says when you trust him and you put your faith 
in him. He does miracles. We're not, we're not trying to raise fi finances and, and do things so that we can have bigger facilities and all that, unless, of course, we're going to use those facilities to minister to more people, which is always our goal. But we're going to do it to change lives and to take care of the people that we are ministering through in this church and that God is using. So why would we change it? He's the one who has all the capital, and he uses his people to bring it. Thank you for doing your job doing your part, living your commitment to the Lord. I know some of you are writing a check and you don't know when that bank account's gonna run out, a day, two days, three days. Some of you are actually giving and you don't even have it. You don't even know when the next check's coming. And God is honoring your faithfulness. He promises this. He will take care of your needs. So what you gotta do is request that God gives you the wisdom to see things the way he does. That's when you don't worry. And then the fourth key in James when it comes to problems and trials and testings so that I can be happy. And I mean happy days are here again when we live these keys. Re re ready myself to receive God's untold provisions and true happiness during difficult times. Ready myself. Now, I talked about getting ready for God's blessings in the midst of chaos. I think of it this way. I'm a pretty simple person. I cannot remember a time, nor would I ever, I would cringe to think I've ever done this, but I can't remember a time where I ever planned on going fishing that I got up and got all my gear together that night before and said, well, I can't wait to go and get skunked. Oh, I'm probably going to catch nothing. It's going to be a terrible day. I, why would I do that? Who does that? I, I actually, I know some people that do that. They sabotage their success before they even start out on the journey. I can't imagine playing a game, a sports game, coaching, playing, any of that, and thinking, well, we're going to lose, but we'll go out there and give it our best shot. Never. Why? Because that is self-sabotage. Some of you are doing that. Some of you are struggling with it right now. And I get it because your, your perspective needed to be changed. And, and key three was to change that. But what you've got to do is ready yourself. You're like, well, ready myself for what? Look at James chapter one again. If your faith remains strong, even while you're surrounded by life's difficulties, you will continue to experience the untold blessings of God. True happiness comes as you pass the test with faith and receive the victorious crown of life promised to every lover of God. When you are tempted, don't ever say, God is tempting me. For God is incapable of being tempted by evil and he is never the source of temptation. Instead, it is each person's own desires and thoughts that drag them into evil and lure them away into darkness. Evil desires give birth to evil actions. And when sin is fully mature, it can murder you. So my friends, don't be fooled by your own desires. Don't be fooled by your own desires. Now there's a lot that needs to be said regarding this passage. And I only have a few minutes, but I, I want to make sure that we see it. First of all, every gift God freely gives us is good and perfect and streaming down from the Father of lights. I mean, how cool is that? But you also need to hear this. In these verses, he says, God never tempts us. You know, I hear this probably more than most people, maybe more than anybody other than other preachers. People say, why is God doing this to us? Why did God send this plague? Why is God wrecking my finances? Why did God put that, that woman in front of me that I'm lusting after and she's not my wife or that man that I want to be with and not my husband or whatever? And we start blaming God for things he would never do. His character wouldn't allow it. Remember, the world was tainted with sin when Adam and Eve messed up. And they sinned and they infected all of us. We are diseased with sin. Not just a virus or temporary illness. We have a terminal illness called sin and it will end in death. And for some it will be eternal. For others who know Jesus, it will be everlasting life with God. Because of that, he says, God isn't trying to hurt you. He's trying to build you up. And then he says this, God was delighted to give us birth by the truth of his infallible Word. I, I bet most of you are thinking, well, that's the Bible. 
Well, the Bible is God's word, but that's not what's being referenced here. This reference is talking about Jesus. Matter of fact, in John chapter 1, verse 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Jesus was the living embodiment of the perfect Word of God. Everything in the Bible was written by Jesus. It was written by God through His Holy Spirit. And Jesus fulfilled every single qualification for perfection in his life here on earth. And in John chapter 1, verse 12, it says, Yet some people accepted him, speaking of Jesus, and put their faith in him. So he gave them the right to be children of God. And then he says, The, world, the word became a human being and lived here with us. We saw his true glory, the glory of the only Son of the Father, from him, the complete gifts of undeserved grace and truth have come down to us. Jesus is the word embodied. Jesus is the living, breathing word of God. And Jesus is the author and perfecter of our faith. Guys, you need to understand this. God tells us that when we choose and we have to choose to ready ourselves for his untold provisions and true happiness in dark times, he brings it. Many of you are waiting for God to do something, but you haven't done your part. Your part is to say, Lord, I am preparing myself in this moment to receive your blessings. I don't know how you're going to do it, and I don't have to know because I trust you. He's waiting for that act of faith to blow your mind. He will. I know this, not just because the Bible says it's true, because I've experienced it over and over. And of course, I've also experienced the antithesis where I've tried to control it and I've tried to take care of it and I've doubted God and that never works out. Never. Zero. But God, when I trust him, he brings it perfectly. He brings what I need. That's his promise. He's not going to give you everything you want, but he'll he promises to give you everything you need. So right now, with what you're going through, I'm going to pray for us. And I want us to pray very specifically. You're going to see this uh, over the next few weeks. I talked about it in the communion video I did on Facebook. Uh, but I, I want to say this. Uh, when Jesus prayed, he said, guys, let me show you how to pray. And he gave a model. The model prayer wasn't something that we were supposed to religiously, you know, kind of traditionally just utter the exact same words over and over. He wasn't saying that. When he said, our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. What he was telling us is that when you pray, I want four elements to be present. Four elements mindsets. The first is this, and I use an acrostic called ACTS, A-C-T-S. First, we adore God for who he is, no matter what's happening. You know, if you haven't stopped in the midst of this crisis and just said, thank you, Lord, thank you. You're like, Rick, are you out of your mind? No, I'm actually completely lucid. And I'm telling you, if you haven't stopped and said, Lord, I adore you and I trust you, don't ready yourself for blessings because they're not coming. The C stands for confess anything that is standing in the way of God's untold provisions. A lot of times we adore God. We go to church, we worship, we stay at home, we worship, we read the Bible, we pray, but we don't live like Jesus. We don't love. We don't give faithfully. We don't tell people about Christ. We don't live the purposes of God. We just do religious things. God says, you need to, you need to confess that. Get your heart straight. And confession is not like, okay, I got to go see Pastor Rick or some priest and he's going to say, you know, okay, I, I absolve you of your sins. No, Jesus already absolved you of your sins. When you trust in him, you are absolved, as absolved as you need to be. But right now you need to confess, which means to agree that it is so. In other words, I say, God, I felt that conviction. I know what I was thinking was wrong. I know what I was doing was wrong. And I say it is so. God, I was wrong. And he says, boom, you get to experience the newness of your forgiveness all over again. And then the T stands for thank him. Thank him for everything. Thank God for everything. This can be really hard, but we have to say thank you, Lord, for the virus. 
Thank you. Because you used it to inspect, direct, correct, protect, and perfect. Thank you, God. You have your reasons. Thank you, God. Some of you are like, I lost a loved one through this. And, and believe me, I am not flippant about that. That is horrible. It's the worst kind of pain. I can't imagine right now what you are going through, but I'm praying for you and I love you. And I know this, as hard as it is, we have to say, Lord God, I thank you. Thank you for all that you've done and all that you're going to do. Because ultimately, not even death can separate us from God. And finally, the S is for surrender. Surrender to him for your needs and he'll supply them. Surrender to God for what you need. So we adore him, we confess, we thank him, and then we ask him to supply our needs. Surrender and ask him to supply our needs. So I'm going to pray. Before I pray, I want to ask you this question. Have you surrendered to what you thought you had to do to get to heaven? To some concept? To your own so-called goodness? And if you come to that place in your life where you have said, I'm a sinner, and I believe Jesus Christ died for me 2,000 years ago and rose again, and I trust in him. If you have not put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, now's the time. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says, For by grace you've been saved through faith, and not of yourself. It's the gift of God, not of works, so no one can boast. You know what a gift is? It's something you don't earn. It's something you don't pay for. It's something you don't continue paying for. It is something you accept by faith. You take it, it's yours. Today, Jesus is saying, take my death on the cross and my resurrection to save you. Believe that I did that for you and I'll give to you everlasting life. And if you're a Christian, go down that Acts acrostic. Adore God, confess, thank him, and ask him to supply by surrendering to him and he'll do it. Guys, happy days are here again. They are. Life became very simple a month ago. And it is simple, though it's difficult, for a reason. So we focus our attention on the purposes of God. Let me pray for us. And I want to ask any of you who put your trust in Jesus for the first time, just take time and text the word believe to 313131. Just type in believe in the message, 313131. We got a Bible for you. We'd just like to welcome you to the family of God. And if you're a guest, you've never watched us or you've been watching, but you haven't texted the guest line, 313131, the letter or the word guest, okay? Let's pray through that axe acrostic right now. Father God, thank you. Thank you for your word that says we can count it joy when we go through tough times. Father, may we be people, men and women, who are happy because we are your children forever. God, we thank you that in this time, you are God. You are on the throne. You are in charge. Nothing has caught you off guard. Nothing has surprised you. You have not slept or slumbered. You are aware and you are protecting us and you are walking through us, us through this. And God, we adore you. You're everlasting. You're forgiving. You're accepting. You're kind. You're gracious. You're holy. Lord, we confess that we're sinners. God, I confess that my attitude hasn't been right all the time in this situation. That I have probably spoken harshly to someone I love. I've thought things I shouldn't. I've thought things about people I shouldn't. And God, I confess that. But Lord, thank you that, that Jesus died for those sins too. And God, I ask you now that, that you would receive from me an attitude of gratitude. I thank you, Lord, for all that you've done for sustaining us, for protecting us, for watching over this ministry, watching over our families. God, you are so faithful. And Lord, now I surrender to you, believing that you're gonna supply our needs. You're gonna bring us back together. We're gonna celebrate as a body of believers soon. And Lord, we're doing that all over the world, but we're apart. And you know, God, more than anyone, you created us because we're better together. We need each other together. So Lord God, bless those who are listening. Be with them now. We give you the glory and the honor in Jesus name. Amen. Listen, we're not done with the service. We have some worship and one last announcement, but I have two very important things to share. The first is that next weekend is Easter. And it's not the Easter that I had envisioned that we had all been hoping for, but it's an opportunity 
to have more people join us for Easter than we have ever had through virtual church. And you can be a part of helping us do this. Listen, this is our way of reaching out to people who would never come to church otherwise. And now they don't have to. They can watch online. So if you're part of the Grace Church database, you received an email on Friday the 3rd that had graphics for Easter. What we're going to ask you to do is take those graphics, copy them onto your Instagram or Facebook platforms with an invitation and send them to all of your friend group. And by the way, any Christians or people that would be willing, have them share it on their friend group list as well. That will get the information out to thousands and tens of thousands of people. If you're not part of the Grace Church database, we want to we want to get that fixed. But to make this simple, if you'll just go to gracechurchco.com backslash Easter, you'll find the graphics. You can attach those to an email and just email your friends. Now, you might say, well, that's going to take a little bit of work. Listen, guys, we're not doing much right now. And this is a chance to get the gospel out to more people than we ever have in our history. I would love to see us have the largest viewing of a weekend service in the history of this church. That means it's going to have to surpass 20,000 views. And you can help us do that. Let's reach out. Let's get the good news of the Easter message into the lives of every single person we know. So help us do that. Be a part of it. The second thing I need to share is very difficult. This past week, this ministry, me personally, and many other people who love Ed and Katie Klein lost a dear friend. Many of you know that Katie has been struggling with uh, Parkinson's. Uh, she's been struggling with some health issues, going through a lot emotionally. And this past week, she, she left this world. And she left her husband, Ed, of 37 years, her four children, Keenan, Christopher, Candace, and Audrey, grandchildren. And um, she's home now. She's with the Lord. She's whole. But my friends, this has been an extraordinarily painful time for their family. This is what is so devastating about this pandemic on top of so many other things is that we can't reach out and care in person as we normally do. And they can't grieve with friends and family. And all of us to just even be together on a weekend and to, to just cry together and weep the loss, though it's temporary, of our dear friend. Remember, we do not grieve as those who have no hope. We will see Katie again. She is in heaven because she put her trust in Jesus Christ decades ago. Pray for Ed. Pray for the kids and the grandchildren. Pray for those who loved Katie. And may this be a lesson to all of us that our circumstances are, are really painful and they're difficult and we need to stay connected. We need this community. So my friends, as we worship now, I want to ask you that wherever you're at, at the end of this service, you would just pause and pray for the Klein family. Pray for their healing. Pray for their support. Please show that support any way you can. I love you. Let's worship the Lord together. And then I have one more thing to share. Jesus 
Everybody, thanks for joining us on one of the social media platforms, whether it's Facebook Live, Instagram, or you're going to our YouTube channel. If you haven't done that, go ahead and subscribe. On top of that, thanks for going to the website, you watch the live stream, or just go through the Grace mobile app. It makes it simple, it's free, and we'll be here for you. Stay connected. This is our lifeline right now. Obviously, we can't come together. I know a lot of us have cabin fever. We can't wait to get out. But for now, we're going to make the best of it. Just like the message today, happiness has nothing to do with our circumstances or situation. It's not inward about us. It's not outward about other people. It's eternal. It's about God and what he's done for us. If today you made the decision to come to know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, would you do me a favor and text the word BELIEVE to 313131? And maybe you're watching for the first time, or you've watched a couple of times and haven't texted our guest hotline. It's the same number, 313131, and just type in the word GUEST. 
We want to get in touch with you. We won't bother you. We just want to send you a gift and welcome you to the family of God or to this family here at Grace because you're part of our extended family. Guys, I'm thankful for all that God is doing through this difficult time. You know, it may be a pandemic and some people may be panicking, but God is causing his church to thrive. The church will never, ever cease to exist. It'll be on and on and on forever. Next weekend is Easter, and we can't wait to celebrate Easter with you. It's a great chance for you to promote Easter by calling friends, texting, sending emails, and inviting them to watch online as a family. So next weekend, oh, happy day. Can't wait for you to celebrate with us, and I know that God's gonna encourage your heart. Stay in touch, stay connected, and we'll see you next weekend. I love you guys. God bless.